Okay, let's get started. Reminder, if you needed that, your project is due a week from today. 5 p.m. It's the last day of class. There's no, you can't put it off anymore. The final exam is a week from Friday. So things are coming fast and furious. But for the moment, focus on getting the project done. I know you want to get to the final, get ready for it, but the best way to get ready for the final is to do the project. It might seem like you're pulling teeth, there's lots of details, but that's exactly what you need to work with right now to get the kind of focus you need for the final. So for the moment, stay focused on getting the project done. Okay. So I would, I would try. My, my, my objective, if I were you, is to get the number crunching done by Friday or early Saturday. I mean, you don't want number crunching to go on till It will happen. There'll be one person in your group who finds out on Friday morning that he's been using the wrong company's financials. <laughs> in which case, the best thing to do is probably switch companies to the wrong company and move on, right? <laughs> Claim, I know it was the wrong sector, it's a retail company and a steel company, but don't, I mean, don't do rash things this week. Rash things in the sense, abandon a company you've been working with because you found a glitch that you can't work through. Okay? I've had at least half a dozen emails overnight, panic emails, companies say, with people saying, my company has negative book value of equity. Do I need to change my company? No. I know it's a pain in the neck. You know where it's going to come in? Where does the negative book value of equity affect you? There's only one place in the entire analysis where negative book value of equity shows up. So when you compute return on equity and return on capital, right? Keep your eyes on the big picture. What's the question we're asking when you look at computer return on capital? Does your company take good investments? That's really the question you're trying to answer. If return on equity doesn't work, use something else to answer the question. Because the question, the big question, these are all numbers you feed into answer. They shouldn't be the basis for the entire answer. So if you have negative book value of equity, the return on equity becomes meaningless. The return on capital is still meaningful. But you might get this astronomically high number. That doesn't mean the company's taking great projects. It's because they've written down their capital to reflect the mistakes they've made in the past. It's one of the problems, I think, with accounting, is they let companies take their mistakes off their books. You know what I'm talking about? Restructuring charges, one-time charges. What are those, really? Reflections of past mistakes that you're taking off the books. And by taking them off the books, you reduce your book capital. You make things look kosher again. But they're not. So in a sense, look past the numbers and try to keep your focus on the big question. So let's return to where we were. We were talking about dividend policy, and we looked at two companies. We looked at Disney, 2003, Disney 2009. We could see how much the company shifted. And the biggest thing that shifted was not so much the company, but the degree of trust you had in the top managers. The more you trust managers, the more likely it is that you will let companies keep your cash. The second company we looked at was Ara Cruz, a company that paid too much in dividends, but we could see why. It paid too much in dividends because it had issued these non-voting shares. We had to pay the dividend to keep the shares non-voting. So these managers faced a choice. Are you going to give up control or are you going to drive the company into the ditch? And guess which, one, which choice they decided to make? They decided to drive the company into the ditch. You see this happening over and over again in companies where control becomes the key factor. And it's not just Brazilian companies. It could be large US companies with voting shares and non-voting shares, where you see control become front and center. The key objective of the company becomes maintaining control. So today I want to turn to a third company, British Petroleum. And again, I'm going to go back in time. But this time, I'm going to go back in time almost 20 years. I used to do a two-day corporate finance session for British Petroleum in the early 90s. It was the strangest session I'd ever done. What they would do is they'd pull about a dozen of their smartest petroleum engineers from around the world. They'd bring them to London. They'd put them in a room with me and say, teach them all the corporate finance they need to know in two days. And you know what? Those guys got it after about a day. They said, this is corporate finance? This is trivial stuff. This is what they've been hiding from us in the finance department all this time? So they got it, but as part of that presentation, I would take BP, because that was the company they were most familiar with, and do everything, I'd, so I do, I use BP as my lab experiment rather than Disney. So as part of that lab experiment, I ran the dividend numbers on BP. 
And the first time I ran those numbers, I thought I'd screwed up big time. And you're going to see in a minute why when I give you the summarized numbers. This is 1983, 1982 through 1991, 10 years. Okay? I computed the free cash flow equity for BP. And the free cash flow equity was $571 million. So I'm going to ask you a question, and the answer is actually trivial. So don't think too much. If you have $571 million in free cash flow equity, what's the most you can afford to pay in dividends or buybacks in stock? $571 million, right? They managed to return a billion and a half every year for 10 years with 571 million in cash flows. That's why I thought it screwed up. How does a company return a billion dollars more in cash than it is coming in each year? And when I dug through the numbers, the answer was actually pretty simple. In nine of those 10 years, you know how they came up with a billion? They went out and borrowed the money. Not to take projects, but to pay dividends. There was one year, 1987, it was the year of their IPO one of the most infamous IPOs of all time. The reason it was infamous, in those days, pre-87, on an initial public offering, the offering price used to be set about a week to 10 days before the actual offering. The argument being, what can happen in a week to 10 days? So basically, the investment bank would set the price about 10 days before the offering. And they did that with BP on October 12th of 1987. The well, investment bankers had a price that they thought was a reasonable price. They all go home. And of course, for those of you who remember market history, October 19th of 1987 was the worst single day in U.S. market history. Know what the S&P 500 dropped by that day? Anybody remember? By 21%. I mean, think of the equivalent. That would be, in today's market, that would be the equivalent of a 3,000-point drop in the Dow. A phenomenally bad day, right? Now, if you're the investment banker who priced BP seven days ago, do you see the problem you face? You set the offering price based on what people were paying on October 12th. Now the bottom has fallen out of the market, and in three days, you have to go public at that price you set on October 12th, and you guaranteed the price. One of the most pathetic shows of lack of backbone. You know what the investment banks did? They went to the British government, which was the owner of BP at that time, the lead owner, and they begged to be let out of the underwriting guarantee. They said, this is not the kind of thing that we gave the guarantee for. It's too big. You see the analogy? You insure your house against a fire. The house burns down. The insurance guy comes around and says, this is a really big fire, wasn't it? You say, yes. You know. Well, we really don't cover fires this big. A little fire in the kitchen we'd have covered, but the whole house seems to have burnt down. Hey, that's exactly why we buy insurance, right? This is exactly the kind of scenario for which you pay that underwriting guarantee. And to give the British government credit, they said, hey, you gave us a guarantee, you're stuck with it. So that year, BP actually raised a billion from equity to pay dividends. Do you think this is a problem every year to be paying out a billion dollars more in dividends than you have coming in? It's a big problem, right? It's not as if, a, as if anybody in the company was on it. Everybody in the company knew there was a problem, even the janitor. You know why? Because when he asked for a new broom, the company said, well, I don't know, this year we might have to skip the broom. We need the cash to pay dividends. Everybody in the company knew for years before 1991 that there was a dividend problem. So how come somebody didn't do something about it? To see why nothing happened, go back to the mid-80s. Everybody knows there's a dividend problem, right? So you're at the executive meeting for BP. You're a top executive of BP. Lord so-and-so, Viscount so-and-so. You're all sitting around that oval table at BP headquarters talking about your dividend problem. Now, my Oxbridge accent is not that good. So you bang the table. Oh, boy, we have a dividend problem. Aye, aye, aye. Everybody around the table agrees. Let's cut dividends. Aye, aye, aye. Everybody agrees. Great idea. But nothing happens. So how come? It's a sensible thing to do. To see why nothing happens, I'm going to take you back to one of my favorite stories when I was a little kid. It's about these mice that live in an abandoned house. And they get terrorized by this cat that's moved into the house. So the mice decide they're going to do something about the cat. So they call a mice meeting. I don't know what a mice meeting looks like, but it's probably pretty chaotic running around. One of the mice has this absolutely brilliant idea. He says, I know, I know. I know how we can take care of the cat. Let's put a bell on the cat. That way when he's around, we know he's around, we can all scatter off into our different corners. We'll never get caught. Aye, 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 all the other mice think, brilliant idea. 
until one of the more practical mice asked the key question, which is, who's going to put the bell on the cat? Not me, not me. Maybe you could do it. Great idea, but nobody wants to do it. Let's go back to the BP meeting. We have to cut dividends. Aye, aye, everybody agrees. And somebody asks a key question. Who's going to tell the stockholders? You think, what's wrong with telling the stockholders? We can't afford to pay this dividend. We should tell them. There's a saying in dividend policy that I've used before. You get the stockholders you deserve. Remember, if you don't pay dividends, who buys your stock? People who don't like dividends. You pay little dividends, you get stockholders like little. You pay huge dividends, you get stockholders who like huge dividends. You pay astronomical dividends, you, you know who you get? You get every dividend addict in the world. They're all in that room. And what are you going to tell them? I'm going to take your dividends away. Good luck to you making it alive out of that room. Old ladies with handbags will come at you. How dare you cut my dividends? That's what I buy my groceries with. So that meeting, you know, somebody says, I shouldn't. Who tell the stockholders? Not me, not me. I'll have laryngitis. The meeting's five months away, but I'll plan to have it in advance. So nobody wants to do a thing. But in every meeting, there is that facilitator. You know the, one, the guy I'm talking about? He says, let's wait a year. Maybe something good will happen. Which for an oil company is what? Maybe oil prices will go up and our problem will go away. In fact, there was a brief period in 91 where it looked like BP's dividend problem had gone away. When Saddam Hussein wandered into Kuwait and oil prices doubled. For a brief period, you could see people at BP's headquarters <coughs> dancing on the desk saying, no more dividend problem. A few weeks later, it was back. <coughs> Everybody here, I think, would agree that this is unsustainable, right? Everybody agrees that the right corporate finance thing to do is to cut dividends. To show you there's no justice in the world, this is what ha the news story was the day after the dividend was cut. BP shares plummet after dividend is slashed. They did the right thing, right? You know why they did the right thing? Somebody have the courage to finally do the right thing? What, what do you think drove them to cut dividends? Where did they get the billion dollars every year? They went and borrowed the money, right? And in 92, when they went to borrow the money, the banks finally said, no, we can't lend you the money. You're already the most levered oil company in the world. So they were forced to cut dividends. But the markets still didn't like it when they did it. In fact, to complete the story, though, six weeks later, the stock price had fully recovered. So what was happening in that six-week period? But in the time they cut dividends and it recovered. Initially, when you cut dividends, what's happening? Those dividend addicts are leaving the room, right? New investors are coming in. And that's never going to be a painless process for a large company. In fact, as those dividend addicts were leaving the room, they stampeded and took half the top managers with them. Because right after this dividend cut, half of the top management at, at BP lost their jobs. And you know what? They deserve to lose their jobs. Why? Because they didn't deal with this problem on their own terms. They waited till they were forced to deal with the problem. And therein lies a lesson. When you see a company pay dividends, it cannot afford. It's far better to take your medicine early and cut dividends and to wait to have the decision thrust upon you, as it inevitably will. Because sometime down the road, you're going to be forced to cut dividends. Control your own destiny if you can. If you're paying too much in dividends, cut dividends. Will markets treat you kindly? Not at all. They'll punish you. But they'll punish you less if you do it on your terms rather than have it thrust upon you. In fact, this I think is one of the most painful things for a company to face. Is they're paying dividends they cannot afford. How do you get out of this box? Hey, you're going to cut dividends. My suggestion is if you're going to cut dividends, do it early and manage the process. To give you a sense of what I mean by manage the process, this is actually from a study that looked at dividend cuts. Bad news, right? We saw it on average. And it broke down those dividend cuts by what other news came around the time of the dividend cut. So those companies that cut dividends and announced a loss at the same time. The stock price dropped 7.23% in the quarter before they did this. It dropped 8% on the announcement of the dividend cut. And it came back, but only a little bit. So the stocks was down about 13 or 14 percent from where it was before the earnings loss and the dividend cut. So there, there's nothing but bad news because, in a sense, if you say I'm cutting dividends and I lost a billion dollars, what the market reads into it was, hey, you had no choice; you were forced to cut dividends. The second 
is when you have a dividend cut following an earnings loss. So you had an earnings, you know, you announced loss two months ago, three months ago, four months ago. Again, 7.58% in the prior quarter, 5.5% in the announcement, but here the, the effect again is a little smaller because the dividend cut didn't happen with the earnings cut. And here's the third scenario. These are companies that announce a dividend cut, but in conjunction with that announcement, they also tell you what they're going to do with the cash. They say, we're cutting dividends, and by the way, we're Lucent, we're a technology company, this is what we're going to invest the money in. Do markets believe them? Initially, you still get the negative response because nobody believes you. But then if you carry through and look at the following quarter, you see a bounce back in the stock price. So if you're cutting dividends, cut them early and cut them for the right reasons. Cut them for the right reasons in the sense you need the cash for other investments. Give markets a chance to kind of assimilate that information. You have a better shot of walking away from this with less damage done to you than otherwise. Last example, or actually second last example. This is a limited. Limited was one of the big growth stories of the 1980s. Now, of course, it's a mature company struggling to stay alive in this new retail landscape. In the 1980s, the gap in the limited were the fastest growing retail companies on the U.S. landscape. So this is actually 1983 to 92, the peak of the limited's growth period. There's their free cash out equity, minus $34.2 million each year on average. I won't even insult you by asking how much dividends can a company with negative free cash flow pay out? Because the answer is, you shouldn't be paying dividends. But look at this, they managed to pay out $41 million in dividends each year. Some of you are working with growth companies that pay dividends. Some of you have companies with negative free cash flow equity where the company insists on paying dividends. You're probably sitting there, are they crazy? Why did they do that? I'm going to put the best possible spin on why young growth companies start to pay dividends. They're usually responding to a sales pitch. And this is how the sales pitch goes. And you tell me whether you'd buy into the sales pitch. You're a young growth company. You're paying no dividends. I'm your advisor, investment banker, consultant, whatever you want, me to, want to call me. I come to you and say, look, right now you're not paying dividends. And if you don't pay dividends, there are investors out there who cannot buy your stock. Is that true? Are there investors who buy? Absolutely, there are some pension funds that are required to buy stock only in companies that pay dividends. So here's what I suggest. I say, look, I know you can't afford to pay dividends, but why don't you pay a little dividend? A token dividend. If you pay a token dividend, then you can get on the list of all these people who could not buy you before. You expand the demand for your stock, your stock price. Sounds good, right? Just a token dividend. What's the danger of doing that if you're a young growth company? You pay a token dividend. Let's say this plan unfur you know, uh, works out as, 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 as uh, in, in the way you expected it to. You now have these people who like dividends buying your stock. How do I describe these dividend investors? I call them dividend addicts, right? What happens if you offer an addict a token? Have a little cocaine, please. Stop right there. Doesn't work that way, right? You give a dividend addict a little dividend, what do they want next? They want more. Don't invite these people into the room unless you want to feed that addiction. And you cannot feed that addiction. If you cannot afford to pay dividends, don't pay dividends. I don't care how alluring the story sounds, those investors are not the investors you want holding your stock. But this is how young growth companies get into trouble. They say, let me pay a little dividend. In fact, in this story, the limited started by paying a million dollars in dividend. That was a token dividend. By the time they got to year 10, that was $101 million. There's the addiction feeding on itself over time. So if you have young growth companies that shouldn't be paying dividends and are paying dividends, give them the right advice. Whether they take it or not is a different issue. The right advice is you should stop paying dividends. You should not be buying back stock even if everybody else in the sector is doing so. Here's my last example. Tata Chemicals. Remember, it's a family group company we've been tracking all the way through. So I looked at the free cash flow equity. It's about 2.3 billion rupees. The dividends were about 1.6 billion rupees. They have no stock buybacks. So every year they're holding back cash, right? Now, when we talked about Microsoft and US companies not paying out what they can afford to in dividends, 
Where did that difference between free cash flow equity and dividends end up in these companies? Where did they put the money? It went into cash balances, right? Tata Chemicals, the cash balance barely changed over this period. So if they're holding back this money, if it's not going into cash, where is it going instead? Remember the HDS page I showed you for? What did you see on that page? Seven other Tata companies in which Tata Chemicals held stock. This cash is being reinvested by the family into other Tata companies. You think, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it, but you don't get to pick which Tata company. If they've given the money to you, you might have picked very different companies to invest in, but with family group companies, this is conventional. They use this as an internal capital market, where effectively they take companies that generate a lot of cash and use that cash to subsidize other companies in the group. Sometimes those companies don't deserve to be subsidized. It's another factor that comes out of family group companies that you should be aware of, because it's not just Tata Chemicals. You'll see this on, it's on any family group company. So when you're done with your five, six, seven companies, however many companies are in your group, think of putting them on a matrix. Because ultimately the question you're asking is, if my company has a big cash balance, do I trust the managers of this company with my cash? And the answer is going to vary across companies. So here, at least in 2009, I'd put some companies, and where I'd put them on the trust matrix. There's Apple. 2009, on the trust matrix, they're way up there. Why? Because they performed so well, picked great projects, delivered great stock returns, they accumulated, at that point in time, only 45 billion in cash. Didn't bother me in the least. There's Intel, another company that has accumulated cash, but has had a pretty rocky six, seven, eight years. Yahoo, another company, we look in every dimension. So where should I trust you? Companies that accumulate cash and don't deliver are much more likely to come under pressure. Then you got Disney. Disney had actually accumulated some trust, but they were actually returning so much cash, they were running a deficit. Maybe they were doing it to make up for previous years, but it's time to get back into sync. And there's our accrues, a company you don't trust in terms of its cash, but it's also taking terrible projects. Of course, remember, the CFO has also created this side problem for them by making this big bet on derivatives that went bad. So when you look at a company, there is going to be no one answer. So if you ask me, is 10 billion in cash too much cash? I'm going to turn the question back to you. Say, to whom? Who, what company are we talking about? 10 billion in cash might be trivial. I might not care about it in the hands of a good company. 1 million in cash might be too much cash in the hands of a bad company. So there's no such thing as a right cash balance or a wrong cash balance. It really has to be company specific. Okay? So when, you get, when you're done with that free cash flow equity dividend analysis of your company, Compare the dividends of free cash rate equity. Then look at your EVA, look at your Jensen's Alpha. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. I know the dividend spreadsheet does a return on equity for you as well, but you already have a lot of ammunition. By the time you get to the dividend section, if I asked you, is this a good company? Has it been well run? You should have a narrative going. This is about establishing a narrative that runs across your different sections. Each section is not an independent, it's the same company. So you can't be reinventing the wheel here based upon what you see about the company. Tell me whether in this company you're going to put pressure on the company. It's about you. I'm not asking collectively whether you put pressure on the company to return the cash or whether you're okay with this company holding on to your cash. Any questions about dividend policy? Okay. So that's basically the intrinsic way of thinking about dividends. But again, I'm going to be honest and tell you that most companies don't set dividends based on their free cash flow equity. They don't look at what they can afford to do, they look at what everybody else is doing. So as an example, if you went to Disney and said, you're paying too much in, you know, too much in dividends, or too little in dividends, the first thing they do is they pull up this sector spreadsheet of other companies in the sector, what they're paying in dividends. So this is, these are all entertainment companies. There's the payout ratio, there's the dividend yield. The average across these companies is about 40% in terms of payout ratio and about 3% in terms of dividend yields. And what does that tell me? Disney would point to this and say, you know what? We're, we're, we're paying less in dividends than we should. Look, we're paying only 17% of our earnings in dividends and 1.67% as the dividend. Two problems here. 
One is by focusing just on conventional dividends, I'm missing the buyback aspect, right? So if you're going to do this, at least bring in buybacks. Second, Disney is a very different company from all these other companies. Many of these companies are young growth, risky companies. Maybe they shouldn't be paying dividends. So to me, it's all if capital structure based on a peer group doesn't make sense, dividend policy based on a peer group makes even less sense. Just because every other bank out there is paying dividends doesn't mean that Citibank should be paying dividends as well. It doesn't make any sense to just base on what everybody else is doing, because you have to look at your specifics as a company. If I applied this to Deutsche, here's where they are. Deutsche Bank, the average dividend yield for across banks in 2009 was 6%. The average payout ratio was about 30.16%. There's Deutsche. Deutsche's dividend yield in 2000, this is just before they cut dividends, was 15.8%. 15.8% dividend yield? But that's right before they cut dividends. Of course, they reduced the dividends by about 85%. And their payout ratio was 119%. Again, there's not much information by looking across companies. You can see how much variation there is. And finally, if you look at Aura Cruz and Tata Chemicals, I looked at paper and pulp companies, and I compared Aura Cruz to emerging market paper and pulp companies, US paper and pulp companies, and global paper and pulp against every one of them. Aura Cruz is paying far too much in dividends. If I look at Tata Chemicals, Relative to everybody, again, it's paying far too much in dividends if you base it on just a peer group comparison. But that's not telling you the whole truth. We know that Tata Chemicals is actually paying less than it can, but based on yield and payout, it actually looks like it's paying you know, far less than the typical firm, or far more than the typical firm in these sectors. So when you think about comparing to the peer group, just look at the industry averages at least, but don't be led by them. Even if everybody else is paying a dividend, if you cannot afford to, why should you? Last piece of this puzzle. Remember that when we talked about capital structure, we talked about looking across the cross-section? I basically took all US companies in January 2009, regressed the payout ratio and dividend yield against variables that I thought should matter in driving those. So basically, I used the return on equity, the standard deviation, the, uh, the stock price, and the earnings growth number, arguing that higher growth companies, more risky companies, should pay out less in dividends. I'll give you the good news first. The signs point in the right directions, the R squares are terrible. It is very difficult to explain differences in dividends across companies based upon their fundamentals. And it's kind of a reflection of the fact that when you use peer groups, you're basically, you know, there's, there's a lot of noise in dividend policy. You don't want to base your dividends on what other companies are doing. So, but if you plug in the numbers for Disney into those market regressions, so basically I took the insider holdings, the standard deviation, the ROE, the predicted payout ratio that I got for Disney, based on its specific characteristics, was about 41%. The predicted yield is 1.72%. If I control for Disney specifics, it looks like it's paying less in dividends than it should. But again, I don't want to read too much into it because I'm not counting the buybacks when I do this. I'm just looking at traditional dividends. It looks like it's paying less dividends than it should. So if you wrap up dividend policy, this aspect of corporate finance, more than anything else, is about trust. Do you trust managers in this company? And if your answer is yes, then you let them ride with their dividend policy. If the answer is no, then you can test them on the dividend policy. Most companies pay out too little in dividends. That's why they have ba cash balances. Some companies, like BP, like Aura Cruz, pay too much in dividends. If you're going to have a problem, it's better be paying too little, it's an easier problem to fix. If you pay too much, it's much more difficult to get out of that problem, as you saw with BP. No questions on dividend policy. Let's do the last section, which is valuation. Okay. One point before I start. I sent you a simplified valuation spreadsheet. There are two versions of the spreadsheet. They're called Ginzu spreadsheets. I don't know whether any of you remember the history of the Ginzu knife. It was the first infomercial ever made. I, I remember when I came over here in 1979, I, I actually hadn't seen much TV, so I turned the TV on. The first show I ever watched was a rollerblading. Have you ever seen rollerblading? You know, this is women going around in circles, whacking each other off the thing. I said, it's a great country or what? <laughs> and then I kept watching. And the next show I saw was Three's Company, which kind of elevated my intellectual capacity right away. <laughs> And then, I could, since I couldn't stop, I stayed awake because I was in a different time zone. And around 11.30 or midnight, this is Japanese guy who came out with these knives. 
And basically, I was, I was fascinated. He said, you can get these three knives for 1995. And then I kept watching. Those three knives became like 24 knives. I could have become a serial killer just by sending my money into the show. But the Ginzo knife commercial was all about, you know, you start with three, you know, I keep adding things, and by the time you're done, you... So these spreadsheets, I started with a basic spreadsheet, and then I kept adding things, like a ratings component, you know, R&D and options components. So they became kind of these... If you look at the bottom, you look at the worksheets, there are like eight or ten different worksheets. So they're, all, they're designed to be all in one valuation model, so you're not going back and forth. I have a more extended version of a Ginzo valuation model on my, on my website. The problem with that model, though, is it lets you make some terrible mistakes. In other words, you can do strange things, and I let you hang yourself on that. So I decided it wasn't quite fair, because we're doing valuation towards the very end of this class. I should give you a more contained spreadsheet, for lack of a better word, where I make default assumptions to keep you from being really crazy on your valuation. So use the simplified worksheets, got it default assumptions. Try not to mess with the default assumptions unless you know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, go ahead. May not relax them, do whatever you want. But if you don't know what you're doing, let it do its work in the background. It'll ask you for numbers in your company. Magic will happen. But today we're going to talk about that not being magic. That basically what's happening in the spreadsheet is very basic valuation. Having said that, as I teach a valuation class, I'm fascinated with the valuation. There's not a whole lot of valuation that you see out there. Not in portfolio management, not in corporate finance. There's a lot of pricing. There's a big difference between pricing and valuation. Most valuation experts that you see out there are pricing experts. They can price something. In fact, what Oscar Wilde said about a cynic could be said about any trader, right? They know the price of everything, the value of nothing. Pricing is, is, the, is, is the name of the game. So I want to talk about valuation because, in a sense, if you get caught up in the pricing game, it's so easy to get misled from what, ma what ultimately matters. So let's, let's see where valuation fits in the big picture. Okay? When you take corporate finance decisions, whether they be investment decisions or financing decisions or dividend decisions, we said there's an ultimate objective. The objective in all of these decisions is to maximize the value of your business. That's what our core objective has been all the way through. But so far, we've really never talked about value. We've talked about capital budgeting. We've talked about capital structure. We've talked about dividend policy. We've talked about how changing how you do those things can change your value. But we haven't really talked about value in the whole, uh, as a whole. So I want to talk about valuation because it brings together everything we've talked about in corporate finance. So let's see the three ways in which you can do valuation. The first approach to valuation is intrinsic valuation. That's about what we're going to do in the next session and a half is we're going to value a company based on its characteristics, its growth, its risk, its cash flows. You say, how else would you value a company? Most valuations you see out there are relative valuations. What do I mean by relative valuations? Think of if, you, if you've ever bought a house or an apartment, and you decide how much to pay for that. Think of how you came up with that price. You looked at other properties in the neighborhood. You look at what they sold for and say, that's what I'm paying. If you get on StubHub, you're trying to buy tickets to the Knicks Heat's playoff game, which might or might not, will they even make it to game four? Can the series be over in three? I don't know, you know. Maybe they'll just put the Knicks out of their misery in game three and say, let's, let's end it after three. But let's say you, say, oh, my. you look at what other people are paying and you get a sense of what you'll be paying to. Most of what we do out there is relative valuation. You pick up an equity research report. What do you see? A multiple and comparables. It's a relative valuation. We're not going to talk much about relative valuation in corporate finance because it really doesn't fit. That's a value. It's a big part of valuation, but it's not a corporate finance view of valuation. So in a valuation class, I actually spend a lot of time on relative valuation. And there's a third approach to valuation, and we kind of opened the lid for this when we talked about option pricing approaches and capital budgeting. We can value a patent as an option. The option to delay, the option to expand, the option to abandon. You can use those, and that's called real options. It's, again, a growing area in valuation. But I want to focus on that first approach, intrinsic valuation, because it allows me to tie everything I've said about corporate finance to a final number. This is what the value of your company should be. So let's look at this, the, the heart of the equation here. Okay? The value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows in the asset. Does that sound familiar? 
That's how we did capital budgeting, right? That's how you price a bond. This is the equation that animates almost everything we do in finance. The value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows on the asset. The risk in this equation is captured entirely in the discount rate. Cash flows are not risk adjusted. They're just expected cash flows. You look across 100 scenarios, fine. Just give me the expected cash flow. So the value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows on the asset. Now, if you expand this to think about a business, and if you think about that financial balance sheet we started this class with, there are two ways you can approach valuation. In the first approach, you focus on just the equity investors in the company. So let me start a business. You guys are going to be the bank. You guys are going to be equity investors in the business. So I borrow money from you. I raise equity from you. I start the business. I generate cash flows as a business. They get first claim on the cash flows, right? So make interest and principal payments. Whatever is left over is available to you as cash flows to equity. I might not pay that out, right? I can hold it like Apple did. I can return it to you as dividends. I can return it to you in stock buybacks. But the cash flows you have left over, the residual cash flows are called the cash flow to equity. If that is the cash flow I'm discounting, the discount rate I should be applying to that cash flow is the cost of equity. Cash flows to equity, discounted to the cost of equity, gives me the value of equity in a business. Now, if I take a very strict view of this and say you're a publicly traded company, what's the only cash flow you as stockholders actually get to see? It's your tangible cash flows. Dividends, right? Everything else is illusion. I mean, I can talk about all the cash flows I want, but the only cash flow you get to see, the dividend discount model is a special case of an equity valuation model. It's the oldest discounted cash flow model out there, but it's an equity valuation model. So that's the first approach to valuation is focus on the equity. Take their cash flows, discount the cost of equity, come up with the value of equity. Here's the alternative. Rather than focus on just the equity investors, I look at the collective cash flow you both make out of the business. You make cash flows equity. What's the cash flow you got as a bank? Interest payments, principal payments. The collective cash flow you make is the cash flow to the firm. If that is the cash flow that I'm discounting, then the discount rate I need to use is a weighted average of what I offered you, which is the cost of equity, and what you demand, which is the cost of debt, which, of course, in corporate finance is the cost of capital. Cash flows to the business discounted back at the cost of capital gives you the value of the entire business. Two questions. One is, once I value the business to get to value of equity, what do I need to do? All I need to do is subtract out what I owe them, right? The value of the debt, I get the value of equity. Second question, can you have a valuable business where equity is worth nothing? Sure. A valuable business, you borrow way too much, the equity can be worth nothing. When we talk about companies going bankrupt, it's not that the business is worth nothing, it's that the equity is worth nothing. So separate the two, the value of the business from the value of equity, and make a decision early in this process as to which one you're valuing. Are you valuing cash flows? Are you valuing equity? Or valuing the whole business? One of the most common mistakes in valuation is people who go back and forth between the two choices as they go through the valuation. So with that background, let's talk about, when you sit down, which cash flows? So you can actually value the equity in a company directly by taking cash flows to equity and discounting the cost of equity. Or you can value the business and subtract out debt to get to the value of equity. So one of the fundamental choices you face when you first sit down to do valuation is, which path are you going to take? Are you going to discount the cash flows equity, value the equity directly? Are you going to value equity indirectly? My suggestion is think about what's involved in each. Because if you do it right, you should actually get the same value for equity at the end. <coughs> think about which one's easier to do. Okay? When we did free cash flow equity, Remember how we computed the free cash flow equity? It's net income plus depreciation minus capex minus change in working capital minus debt payments plus new debt issues. There were like seven line items, except for that shortcut. What was that shortcut we used? We multiplied the reinvestment by one minus the debt ratio, right? And when can you use that shortcut? When your leverage is stable. If you tell me you have a company at a 20% debt ratio and you don't see that debt ratio ever changing, then it's okay to do equity valuation. It's simple. Any other scenario, and what are the other scenarios? You have a company with low debt that you see the debt ratio going up over time. You see a company with high debt where you see the debt ratio going down over time. Or third, you see a company with a debt ratio and you have no idea where it's going over time. It's uncertain. The best thing to do is to value the entire business rather than value the equity.
most cases when you sit down to do a valuation it's better to value the business because it will give you more flexibility down the road the only exception is you're valuing financial service companies investment banks commercial banks insurance companies value the equity because they have the choice why because defining debt is so messy that you're better off valuing so in most non financial service firms if you ask me to pick a default approach to valuation i'm going to do a firm valuation that's why the simple ginzo spreadsheet i sent you is a firm valuation ginzo spreadsheet i have a free cash flow equity ginzo spreadsheet but i don't think it's appropriate for some companies many companies new group it's better to do the value of the firm and subtract out debt to get the value of equity so with that background let's think about the inputs that are going to go into evaluation and if you've looked at the valuation spreadsheet you're going to see these inputs come into play first input i need to value a business is what are your cash flows So here's what we're going to do. You you are going to be firm valuation people. You're going to be equity valuation people. With each input, let's think about how that input will be defined given what you're doing. Okay? So you're valuing the whole business. You're valuing equity. When I ask you what are the cash flows from your existing assets, when I ask that of you of equity investors, the cash flows you should be giving me should be cash flows after debt payments, after interest payments, after principal payments, cash flows to equity. Whereas if I ask you that question, the cash flows you should give me are cash flows before debt payments. So operating income minus you know reinvestment needs, but after debt payments. I'm sorry, before debt payments. So cash flow to the firm is before debt payments. Cash flow to equity is after debt payments. And you can see those numbers can be very different. Second question I'm going to ask you is what's your growth rate going to be? Big big input in valuation, right? What's your growth? When I ask you that question, is equity people the growth rate you should be giving me is a growth rate in equity income, net income earnings per share. When I ask you that question, the growth rate you should be giving me is growth rate in operating income. You say, what's going to be? Oh, it's, income is income. Not necessarily. As you climb the income statement, your growth rates can get much much lower, as, because a three percent revenue growth will translate into a six percent operating income growth, into a ten percent net income growth, and a twelve percent earnings per share growth. So growth rates are going to be different depending on whether you're valuing the firm or equity. Think about that when you sit down. No have any of you looked at the FCF of Ginzo spreadsheet what's the growth rate I ask you what what input do I ask the growth in I ask for a growth rate in revenues keep that in mind because if you go to Yahoo Finance and look up a growth for your company what's the growth rate that Yahoo Finance reports a growth in what input what variable it's earnings per share growth so if you see a 27% or a 50% earnings per share growth and you put that into revenues you're going to overvalue your company revenue growth is going to be more subdued than net income growth which is going to be more subdued than earnings per share growth because you're climbing up the income statement so growth rates are going to be different third question i'm going to ask you is what discount rate should i use and if you're doing an equity valuation the discount rate you should be giving me is cost of equity whereas you should be giving me a cost of capital and already with corporate finance you know the distinction between the two and then i'm going to ask you a final question this is going to sound strange But you already have a sense of why I ask you this question. I'm going to ask you when will your company be a mature company? Saying what the heck is a mature company? A mature company is a company that grows at a rate less than or equal to the growth rate of the economy in which it operates. Why do we need the answer to that question? What did I say the value of an asset was? Or the value of a business was. It's a present value of the cash flows to the business over its life right so if you're sitting down to value a publicly traded company what's the life of a publicly traded company at least in theory when you look at a corporate chart there's a date of incorporation is there a date of death no company could go on and on and on so you know why i need the answer to the question because i want to stop estimating cash flows i can't keep estimating cash flows forever And if you tell me your cash flows grow at 2% a year forever after year 5. You see what I bought? You have cash flow growing at 2% a year forever you have a perpetual growth cash flow, right? And if you have a perpetual growth cash flow, we have that present value equation that captures what happens after that point in time with one equation. It's a device we use with the, with the theme park to capture what happens after year 10. So when will your company be a mature company is a question I need answered because without answering the question I have to keep estimating cash flows and that allows me to come up with that big number at the end the terminal value discount them all back to the present if you're discounting cash flows to equity the cost of equity you value the equity 
If you're discounting cash flows to the firm at the cost of capital, you value the operating assets of the company. You're not done. So basically, these are just the operating assets. You've got to bring in a lot of other stuff to get to the value of equity. So that's how I'm going to frame the valuation lectures. I'm going to take each of these inputs and talk a little bit about how to estimate them. Because that's basically what your valuation spreadsheet is trying to do. So you can see the insides of what I'm trying to do in that spreadsheet. So let's start with cash flows. As I said, the first, path, the first decision you make here is, are these cash flows to the business or cash flows to equity? If it's cash flow to equity, let's take the easy way out. You could just look at dividends and say, I don't even know how to estimate cash flows. I'm going to focus on just dividends. A slightly more involved variant is rather than focus just on dividends is to add stock buybacks for US companies that could add a pretty big chunk of change there. Or the third is to do it yourself, potential dividends, which we define in the context of dividend policy as free cash flow to equity, net income minus whatever you reinvest, net cap exchange and working capital, minus the net debt issue, which is what you do it for dividend policy, but now you're using it to project out into the future. So cash flow to equity can be dividends, augmented dividends, or potential dividends. Cash flow to the firm is going to look a lot like free cash flow equity, but instead of starting with net income, I'm going to start with earnings before interest and taxes or operating income. Think of why. This is a cash flow before interest expenses, so I've got to climb above my interest expense line item. I have to act like I paid taxes on that operating income. Key word is act. Why? Because I actually pay taxes on taxable income. I've got to act like I have no interest expenses. So after tax operating income of net income, net capex, change in working capital exactly like you did with free cash flow equity. But because this is a cash flow to the firm, I don't care about debt coming in or debt going out. It's a cash flow before debt payments. So free cash flow equity is potential dividend. Free cash flow to the firm is potential dividends plus potential interest expenses, principal payments, all the other cash flows. So first step in the process is getting the cash flow nailed down. And before you get ambitious, Get it nailed down for the past, right, before you project out the future. So let me start with my, I'm going to value three companies. I'm going to value Deutsche Bank, I'm going to value Tata Chemicals, and I'm going to value Disney. I'm going to value Deutsche with both a dividend discount model and a free cash flow equity model. Tata Chemicals, I'm going to value only with a free cash flow equity model. And Disney, I'm going to value as a firm. So we'll talk about, you know, so that you can see all three models play out in front of you. So let me start with Deutsche. As I said, pre-2008. When you asked me whether the dividends paid by a bank were reasonable, I'd have thrown up my hands and said, I don't know what the cash flow equity for a bank is. I'm going to assume what they pay out is what they can afford to pay out. Okay? And that's why 2008 was such a breach of trust. Once you lose trust in managers to do the right thing, you can't trust the dividends they pay out as the right dividend. So here's the alternative that I offered when we did the dividend policy section for Deutsche. I said, rather than take the dividends as a given, let me focus on what they could have paid out in dividends. And remember how we, I defined reinvestment for a bank? It's not net capex or change in working capital. It's investment in, work, in, in regulatory capital. Because to grow, you've got to keep your regulatory capital growing. So there's my free cash flow equity for Deutsche. Net income, 3147 There's the increase in regulatory capital. That's my reinvestment. There's my free cash flow equity. So when I value Deutsche, I can either focus on the actual dividends or I can focus on the free cash flow equity. Increasingly with banks, I've started focusing on the free cash flow equity. Classic example, you take a city or a Bank of America, they could pay a dividend, but since they can't afford that dividend, you're much better off focusing on what they should have paid out rather than what, what actually gets paid out. So dividends are actually they're easy. You can actually see what's paid out. Getting free cash flow equity is a little messier, but it's worth the effort of coming up with that free cash flow equity. So when you see the valuation of Deutsche, I'm going to show the valuation both with the traditional dividend discount model and with the free cash flow equity model, so you can see the numbers kind of diverge. Here's Tata Chemicals. As I said, I'm going to use a free cash flow equity model to value Tata Chemicals. So I start with net income. There's CapEx, minus the CapEx, plus the depreciation, minus the change in working capital, minus the change in debt. That's my equity reinvestment, which is this net capex minus. So basically, if you take these, la, these four columns and aggregate them, that's how much equity I reinvested back in the business. There's my percentage of net income that I put back in the business. This is almost like a retention ratio. Retention ratio, you focus just on dividends. Here I'm focusing on what actually gets put back into the business in net capex and change in working capital. So if you look across the five years, 
Tata Chemicals reinvested about 63.62% of its net income back in the business. Is that a good thing or a bad thing to reinvest a lot? Holding all its cons, you want to invest in a company that reinvests a lot or doesn't reinvest a lot? What does it depend on? It depends on where they reinvest, right? If I reinvest a lot and take terrible projects, you'd rather that I not reinvest at all. If I reinvest a lot and take great projects, and you say, that's great, my value goes up. So I've given you half the picture here. I've shown you what Tata Chemicals reinvest. I haven't shown you how well they reinvest yet. But for the first part of the process, I'm just looking at what they made, what their cash flow was, how much they reinvested. Okay? So at this stage, I have a sense of how much Deutsche could have paid out in dividends. I have a sense of how much Tata Chemicals could have returned to its stockholders. Let's look at Disney. Okay? There's my 2008 numbers for Disney. I actually, when I looked at Disney, I was looking at them at the end of a third quarter. It was so basically it was a little messy because I could just stay with the trailing 12 month numbers. So those are my trailing 12 month numbers. Operating income of 7.03, after tax operating income of 4.4 billion, plus depreciation, minus capex, minus change in working capital. My free cash flow to the firm, and remember, this is cash flow available to both equity investors and lenders, is about 3.2 billion out of the 4.4 billion. If I looked at how much they reinvested, which is just that number minus that number, my total reinvestment for the year was 1,154 million. As a percentage, it looked like they reinvested about 26% of their operating income back in 2008. One reason I gave you the simple spreadsheet rather than the full version. In the full version, I ask you for CapEx, depreciation, working capital. I do this for your company. See, that's good. Why don't we do that for all companies? If I look at any particular year at reinvestment, I can get a really low number or a really high number, right? Companies don't smooth out how much they reinvest. Which means if you're going to go down this path, you really should be looking at 2008, 2007, 2006, 2005, 2004. See this normalized column? That was my attempt to clean up the numbers, to get a sense of what Disney actually reinvested in a typical year, rather than build it all off one year. And if you normalize the numbers, here's the biggest change. The capex goes from 2.75 billion to 3.9 billion. See, that's a pretty big increase. You know what they didn't do in 2008 that they sometimes do? What's your biggest capex as a company? What's the biggest lumpy capex that you can make? 10 billion, 50 billion. In fact, Disney had one in 1996 when they bought Cap Cities for 18 and a half billion. What you will not see every year is an acquisition. But if you do one acquisition every three or four years, I've got to bring it into the numbers. So this normalized capex reflects the addition of what I think they need to set aside to cover the acquisition they do once every three, four, five years. In fact, they bought Pixar just the previous year. So they had this big capex, so they decided to kind of sleep in 2008, not do anything. So if you normalize the net capex, basically the reinvestment you get is much higher, 2.34 billion. So it looks like Disney is reinvesting about 54% of its after-tax operating income. So here's how you read the equity reinvestment rate. It's a portion of net income that the company is putting back in the business. The reinvestment rate is the portion of after-tax operating income that the company is putting back in the business. As with Tata Chemicals, if you ask me, is that a good number? I don't know. I don't know what kind of return on capital they had on those investments. Until I know that, I cannot make that final link to value. But first step, start with last year's financials. For most of you, it's going to be 2011's numbers. Look at the operating income. Look at the tax rate. Basically, do just do the free cash flow of the firm by hand. It's not difficult to do. You can do it off the statement of cash flows. See what the free cash flow of the firm was last year. Look at what they reinvested last year. It's the first step in valuing a company's understanding what they did in the most recent year, maybe the most recent three years, getting a sense of what the company actually is putting back into the business. Yes? How did I get the what? Just subtract 3.205 from the 4,359. So it's basically whatever I have is cash flow left over from the after-tax operating income. But if you think about it, this is land, building, equipment that you're adding to, working capital that you're increasing, things you're doing to create future growth. So that's the first step, is getting the cash flows. Let's talk about discount rates. In this one, we've actually done the dirty work already, right? Because we talked about cost of equity and cost of capital in a different context. But when we talk about the cost of equity for a company, we defined it as what stockholders would demand for investing in this company. We used to bottom up data or some device to get there, but that's the definition of cost of equity. And 
in a corporate finance world. So that same cost of equity and cost of capital we've used so far is now going to play double, a double role and become the discount rate we use to discount the cash flows. So since I'm going to be valuing Deutsche and Tata Chemicals using an equity approach, I'm going to come up with the cost of equity for those two companies. For Disney, since I'm valuing the entire firm, I'm going to show you the cost of capital. And when you see these numbers, they should look familiar because these are numbers we already did 200 slides ago. Right? I know they won't look familiar, but we've already done them. So let me go back and do the cost of equity for Deutsche and Tata Chemicals because I need that as my discount rate. The way we estimated the cost of equity for, for Deutsche was we used a beta of similar companies. In fact, we broke Deutsche down into two businesses, commercial banking and investment banking. For commercial banking, we used primarily European banks. For investment banking, we used UK and US-based investment banks. The bottom of beta, 1.162, is the beta that I'm going to use. I'm going to show you two valuations of Deutsche, one a pure dividend discount model pre-crisis, the other a free cash flow equity model post-crisis. There's my dividend discount model cost of equity in early 2008, pre-crisis. Risk-free rate was 4%, bottom up beta, so obviously lever, because for a bank you don't even unlever and relever. And the equity risk premium pre-crisis was only 4.5%. You bring those numbers together, there's my cost of equity pre-crisis. Any of the crisis, 2008. Early 2009, there's the effect of the crisis. The risk-free rate has gone from 4 to 3.6%. The beta is still the bottom of beta. It hasn't changed. The equity risk premium goes from 45 to 6%. So after the crisis, you have a higher risk premium, higher cost of equity. So your cost of equity as a company will change over time, even if your beta doesn't change, because risk-free rates and risk premiums change. So those are the cost of equity you're going to see for the two Deutsche valuations. The dividend discount model, you're going to see 9.23%. The free cash flow equity model, you're going to see 10.57%. For Tata Chemicals, the bottom up beta we estimated was 0.945. Remember, we broke it down into two businesses, chemicals and fertilizers. We came up with the bottom up beta. The risk free rate, because I'm doing everything in repeat terms, is 4%. I know this is going back way, way back in time. But the way I got that risk free rate was I started with the Indian government, rupee bond rate, which is 7%, and I subtracted out the default spread of 3% from that. So this is actually a rupee risk free rate cleaned up for default risk. There's my beta. There's my risk premium for India. Composed of 6% for a mature market plus 4.5% for a developed market. Incidentally, those of you who are working with companies with emerging market exposure, this is how it's going to show up in your valuation is through a higher risk premium, which is going to push up your discount rate and push down the value of these companies, holding all else constant. So there's my cost of equity in repeat terms for Tata Chemicals. Finally, cost of capital for Disney. Again, this, is no, this shouldn't be new. I'm just taking the same cost of capital we've used four times already. To get the cost of, the cost of equity, I used the bottom up beta of 0.9011. And I won't bore you, but we broke it down into five businesses or four businesses. We got the betas for each business. And here I want to tell you, bring up something where I've been the source of confusion. When you compute the beta to use in a cost of equity that goes into a cost of capital, that beta should be based only on the operating assets of the company. You know what I'm talking about? Companies are cash balances. And we know if you bring that cash balance into your beta, it's going to pull down your beta. And if I asked you for the beta for the whole firm and using a cost of equity to do a dividend discount model, that's okay. But if you're using a cost of capital, which is going to be used just on the operating assets of the company, the beta you should be using should be a beta for just your operating assets. If you're in three different businesses, it'll be a weighted average of the betas of the three businesses. Cash should not be playing a role in this discussion if you're talking about cost of equity for a cost of capital. You still have to get the beta corrected for cash for other companies, but once you get that beta for your businesses, don't make cash kind of move that beta around because this beta is going to go into a cost of capital. That cost of capital is attached to the operating assets of the company. So in this case, the beta that I'm using is the 0.9011, which is the beta of just the operating assets of Disney. Risk-free rate, risk premium reflect what I've been using all, all through. Cost of equity for Disney is 8.91%. <laughs> for the cost of debt for Disney, I use the actual rating. For those of you who don't have an actual rating, your synthetic rating is going to come into play. The default spread based on the, that actual rating is 2.5%. Added to the risk-free rate, I get a cost of debt of 6%. 
multiplied by 1 minus the marginal tax rate. Here again, let me deviate. If you have a company in an emerging market and use a synthetic rating spreadsheet to get the rating, you're going to start with the risk-free rate. I don't know whether you do it in dollars, rupees, pesos, reais, whatever. You're going to add the, the default spread for your synthetic rating, but then don't forget to add the country default spread on top because you have that layer of country risk on top of the company risk. Okay? So that's going to go into your cost of debt. Times 1 minus the marginal tax rate gives me an after-tax cost of debt of 3.72%. The weights are market value weights. Market value of equity, market value of debt. That includes the leases in there. The 16682 includes the leases. So they all go into my cost of capital. There's a cost of capital you're going to see for this. So let me review. For Deutsche and Tata Chemicals, since I'm doing an equity valuation, I focus on the cost of equity. For Disney, since I'm doing a whole firm valuation, I use the same cost of capital I've been using all the way through. Now is my discount rate. The one added layer with valuation that you might have to think about is this is my cost of capital right now. I feel completely comfortable with, with Disney saying, hey, your cost of capital right now is 7.5%. But on my valuation spreadsheet, I'm going to do some things to Disney. I'm going to, what do we make the company over time into a mature company? Not every company we make into a mature company. Let's carry that to its logical limit. If you take a young growth company, I know at least one person here is doing LinkedIn, right? Young company, social media company, right now high growth rate, lots of risk. You could end up with a cost of equity of 15%. I don't know what you actually, but it's going to be a high number. You probably have very little debt, so your cost of capital could also be up, up there, 15%. But over time on your spreadsheet, think of what you're doing to LinkedIn. You're making the company go from being a young growth company to a mature company, right? The growth rate's going to come down. So help me out here. As the growth rate comes down and the company becomes more profitable, what should happen to the beta of this company? If you think of beta as a measure of relative risk. Right now, it's a high-risk company with a high beta. But on your spreadsheet by year 10, it's a mature company with a low growth rate that looks a lot like the economy, so its beta should move towards, I would expect it to move towards one over time, the average beta of a company, so you should expect the beta to come down. Let me follow up. Right now, why does the young growth company not have any debt? Because it can't afford to borrow money, it doesn't have much income, right? You needed your optimal debt ratio. You probably came up with a debt ratio of 0%. You're saying, good, you shouldn't be borrowing money. But look at your same company 10 years out. What have you made your company? A mature company with a low growth rate with lots of income, right? Do you think it can afford to carry some debt then? I would think so. Right now, 0% debt sounds okay. But in year 10, the debt ratio might be 20% or 30%. Which means your cost of capital is not going to be a single number. It should change over time. It's something that I think a lot of people who do discounted cash flow valuation fail to take into account. Too often, I'm surprised how often people think about what the cost of capital should be for all the years. It shouldn't be the same number. You should expect the number to change. So to illustrate, let me show you what I did for Disney in my valuation. I started with today's beta. Today's debt ratio, today's cost of capital, right there. And for the next five years, while the gr I kept the growth rate at what today's growth rate is, so I left the cost of capital at today's number. So for the next five years, what you see as the cost of capital for Disney reflects the cost of capital today. But then I started fiddling with the numbers. How? I went to year 10. Year 10 is the year that I'm going to make Disney into my mature company. That's a choice I made. It's an, it's an arbitrary decision. But in year 10, I made it a mature company, so I made the beta 1. So skip these middle years. We'll talk about how I came up with year 6 through, six through 9. So I have year 5, which is up to year 5, it's today's numbers. Year 10, the beta becomes 1 because it's a mature company. It should look like the market, which makes the cost of equity go up. I've left the debt ratio at what it is today. You know why? Because I have an optimal debt ratio of 40% to 30%, but it's obvious that they're not going to go there. So in this case, it's not like they're a young growth company that can't afford to borrow money. They've chosen not to borrow money, and it's not my company. I don't run the company, so I'm going to leave it at 26.73%. So if I leave those numbers together, the cost of capital I end up with at the end of the 10th year is 7.95%. So I know the cost of capital for the first five years. It's today's cost of capital. I know the cost of capital in year 10 is about 8%. I have to fill in the middle years. So let's think about the beta. My beta for the first five years is 0.90, right? 
My bait in year 10 is one. I want to keep my life simple. So here's how I got the bait is in the middle years. I just took one fifth of the difference each year and added, that's what the spreadsheet will do as well. I ask you for an initial cost of capital. You can give me any number you want that you think is reasonable. You're today, so if you enter today's cost of capital, I'll say, okay, I'll start with that. Then I say, look, if you don't tell me anything, I'll make the cost of capital, when you become a mature company, the cost of capital of a mature company, which I know by looking across all companies. It's roughly the risk-free rate plus I think 45 to 5% will give you the cost of capital for a mature company. So if you start off with a 12% cost of capital and you want to get to 7.5%, I'm just going to go in linear steps each year from your 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 to get my cost of capital each year. But the overall principle I want you to keep in mind is your cost of capital can and should change over time for most companies. It shouldn't be a fixed number. So cash flows can either be cash flows to equity or cash flows of firm. Discount rate can either be a cost of equity or cost of capital with the caveat that it can shift over time. Which brings me to the third input, which is growth. Many of you, I mean, many of you, I'm sure, I'm sure some of you worked at investment banks before you came back, before you came back for, how many worked at investment banks before you came back for an investment? Don't worry, I won't pick on you, but maybe I will pick on you. Okay. Did any of you do valuations in your prior lives? I'm going to ask you a question. I'd like an as close to an honest answer as you can give me. Right? If you've done valuation, one of the key inputs in evaluation is the growth rate, right? So if any of you have ever worked in an internship in a job and you've done valuation and you think about the growth rate, where did you get that growth rate? Yes? One is you looked at historical growth, which makes sense. It's a good place to start, right? So one is historical growth. Any other? You looked at analyst reports, but no, which is you know, IBEST. In, in, in the US, it's very easy to find a growth rate. In, in fact, many of you are going to be tempted when you sit down to value companies to pick an analyst growth rate. And you can see why, right? I've never valued a company. These guys do it all the time. They must know what they're doing. Dangerous statement to make. But look at analysis. Any other? Growth in the overall market. So you look at macro variables. How quickly is the market growing? Any of you guys ever asked the management of the company for growth rates? Surprising number of valuations. You know where the number comes from? You ask managers how fast. How stupid is that? What do you think they're going to say? We're terrible managers. We're going to ruin the company? Or worse still, you ask the managing director, what growth rate should I use? And like God, he gives you a number. Use 18%. So oh, what a brilliant guy you must do. What I'm trying to say, in most valuations, growth comes from outside. Whether that source is good or bad, it comes from outside the valuation. And if that's the way you get growth rates, you're doomed. You know why you're doomed? Let's say you use historical growth, analyst estimate, MD's forecast, management forecast, use a 12% growth rate, you come up with a value of $25. And it's too low. So what do you mean it's too low? If any of you have done valuation for a living, you know that even before you start the valuation, there's a number you are expected to deliver. You don't sit there with an empty spreadsheet saying, what number is this? You're not a scientist. You have a deal to get done. So before you even enter the numbers, you know you want to come up with about 45. Why? Because that's about $6 above the today's stock price, and that might justify the acquisition that should never have been done in the first place. So you come up with 25, and you use a 12% growth rate, and you want to get to 45. What's the easiest way to get to 45? Take the 12, make it 14. After all, it's a number you made up anyway, right? I mean, you can dress it up as much as you want, but you're still dressing up a turkey. Make 12, you try 14, 16, 18, 20. And you know what? At some growth rate, you come up with $45. And then you reverse engineer that growth rate to give it all kinds of patina of having done the research to back up that growth rate. It's human nature. It's not your fault. Don't beat yourself up if you've done this, because that's exactly what human beings do when you start out with bias. So given that human nature is going to drive you down that path, the best thing to do is to not make growth exogenous. Let's face it. 
you and I don't have the power to go around endowing companies with high growth rates. I can say, I like that company. In fact, my mother-in-law called me about this company called SanDisk, which is a company that makes these uh, USB flash drives. She's uh, addicted to CNBC. She watches it every day. She finds these companies she fixates on. She wants to buy these companies. It's an entertainment sport for her. So I try to play along. I say, okay, I look at the company. And if it's you know, reasonably co- priced, I say, okay, that'll be a fun game for you. Buy the stock. Watch it go down the ticker. Let no. So I looked at SanDisk, and I was trying to value it. You know? And you know, it's quite clear that if I, if, I, if I wanted to make it valuable, I'd just give it a higher growth rate. But I don't have the power to do it. Ultimately, the growth of a company comes from where? From what it does as a company. In fact, if you boil it down to basics, for a company to grow fast, it has to pull off a fairly amazing feat. It has to reinvest a lot. That's actually easy. But while it's reinvesting a lot, it has to reinvest well. You see why that's so difficult? Lots of companies reinvest a lot, but reinvest badly. Lots of companies reinvest very little, but can reinvest well. But you have to reinvest a lot and reinvest well. Rather than make growth an exogenous input, I'm going to make it an endogenous input. I'm going to, I'm going to come up with the, I'm going to let the company's numbers give me a growth rate rather than make a number up. Algebraically, the growth in earnings for a company is a function of that retention ratio, how much you reinvest and how well you reinvest. If you're talking about an equity valuation, here are the two numbers I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus on the percentage of net income that you put back into the business, defined either as a retention ratio or an equity reinvestment rate. And I'm going to measure how well you reinvest with a return on equity. Not necessarily last year's return equity, but something to do with what you, what do you make as a return equity in your project. So let's take an example. Let's suppose you have a company with an 80% retention ratio. 80% of its net income is retained, and it earns a 20% return equity. 80% times 20% gives you a growth rate of 16%. So if you're talking about equity growth, it's retention ratio times return equity. If you're talking about growth and operating income, which is what most of you would be focusing on because you're valuing the firm, I'm going to measure how well you reinvest with the reinvestment rate. Remember how I computed that for Disney? It's a total reinvestment divided by the after-tax operating income. And I'm going to multiply that by how well you reinvest measured as the return on capital. Stay internally consistent. If you're valuing the firm, everything should be stated in terms of overall capital and returns on that capital. If you're valuing equity, everything should be focused on equity. Reinvestment rate times return on capital is my expected growth in operating income. What it does is it takes a huge weight off your shoulders. Rather than you saying, look, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, you look at what the company does and you get the growth rate from what the company does. So let's try this for our three companies. We take Deutsche. Deutsche, since I'm doing an equity valuation, I'm going to focus on their retention ratio and their return on equity. So if I looked at 2008, the, the first valuation is a dividend discount model, the retention ratio was about 67%. So in other words, they paid out 33% of their net income as dividends. The remaining 67% went back in the company. The return on equity they earned in 2007 was about 19.5%. They were doing extraordinarily well. 67% retention ratio, about 19.5% return equity. If they can sustain those numbers, and it's a big F, Their expected growth rate is going to be almost 13% a year. Retention ratio times return equity. Now, if I'd done my valuation in 2008 and I'd used a 13% growth rate, I'd have based it on 2007 numbers, right? I'd have been okay with it. One year later, when you look at Deutsche, everything's changed, right? The crisis has hit them. In 2008, if I looked at those numbers, those numbers would have been very different. Because things can change. You can't take a peak here and build it into your valuation. So here's what I did in my 2008 valuation. Rather than base everything on 2007 numbers, I looked at the average return on equity between 2003 and 2007, which was about 11.8%. The average retention ratio was about 45.7%. When I did my growth rate for Deutsche, the growth rate you're going to see, based on those average numbers, is about 5.4%. 
When you're sitting down to value a company, be careful not to act like the whole world started last year. Your company could have had a terrible year last year, it could have had a great year last year, but if it's been around a while, look at what it did two years ago, three years ago. Of course, if your company's been around only four quarters or six quarters, I, I think somebody's doing Groupon, you're not going to get a whole lot of history there. Okay? But if you have a company with history, look at the history, look at what it's done in good years, look at what it's done in bad years. You're valuing your company for the foreseeable future, not just for the next year. So that's what's going to drive my estimation of growth rates is how much do you reinvest, how well did you reinvest. So for Deutsche, the growth you're going to see in the company, in my 2008 valuation is 5.4% in the dividends per share. To get my Tata Chemicals growth rate, I need a retention ratio and I need a return equity. Here again, I was very cautious about doing it off one year, so I computed a reinvestment rate across five years. And this is the table I showed you earlier. And over that five-year period, which is in this case is 2003 to 2008, they reinvested about 64% of their net income back. Their return on equity and average over this period was about 17.34%. But again, I'm averaging across that. If I believe those numbers can be sustained in the future, their expected growth rate is going to be about 11% a year. Again, I'm tying my growth rate to how much they reinvest and how well they reinvest. And here's my final point about, about growth. When you talk about growth in equity earnings, the number that matters is return equity. High returns in equity are good. They push up the growth rate. But here's the flip side of return equity. There are two ways you can deliver a really high return equity. One is to do, the, do it the Apple way. Take great projects that deliver a really high return equity. And the other way of delivering a high return equity is if you have been real estate, you know what to do, right? How do you deliver a really high return equity? You take a very small slice of equity, you borrow a ton. Leverage can help you on return equity as long, and this is the necessary condition, as long as the returns you make on your investment, the capital, exceed the cost of debt. In other words, if you can borrow money at 4% and invest it at 10%, you can claim that 6% difference as a return equity. So when you look at a high return equity for a company, and you can check this for your company, check to see whether it's coming from great projects or whether it's coming from the fact that they use a lot of debt. The reason it matters is which one's more valuable, return equity from taking great projects or return equity that comes from taking a lot of debt? And how would I punish a company that has a high return equity by taking on a lot of debt? What's going to happen? The high return equity is going to give me a high growth rate, right? The high growth rate is going to give me higher cash flows to equity. But then what do I discount those cash flows to equity at? A cost of equity that comes from using a levered beta, so that same high debt to equity ratio that pushes up your return equity is also going to push up your cost of equity. So when I have leverage driving up return equity, I have a way of bringing it into the valuation if I adjust the cost of equity for that same leverage. So when you look at return equity, keep in mind what causes that return equity to be high or low for other companies. Okay? So let's uh, stop on that page and we pick up, we're going to do terminal value. But if you could, here's what I'd suggest, bring in your valuation spreadsheet on your laptop to class on Wednesday. We'll do a collective valuation therapy exercise. Okay? Or you can enter the numbers for your company. Let's see what happens. So bring your spreadsheet with you on Wednesday. The dividend yield will be high. The dividend yield will be high. Yeah. So because it's risky. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. Yeah. Sorry, question. When you were talking about BP having mm -hmm. to pay out way too high with dividend, they don't want to generate any profits for one of the cash flow. But free cash flow to equity, that includes net debt, which includes debt the issue. Debt. But then you said that they were borrowing yeah. rent. So I it's did. after the year exactly. they had to borrow more money? Exactly. In order to make lag, They were lagging in borrowing. So basically that's what it was. So I'm not counting that extra billion. That's almost an unusual debt that we could make. Oh, I see. If you bring that in, then of course the free cash It should catch the next year, though. It should catch up the next year, basically. But in this case, I'm keeping it separate because I want to see how they... I scrubbed out that big debt issue because it's actually clear. They're taking that billion. 
in because if you count that billion, it looks like a thing that free cash back will give us. Yeah. But it's not a very healthy way. It's coming in primarily from the So how do you back into it? If you're looking the best at way to do it is look at your debt ratio. Right? If, if your debt keeps ratio see, keeps going up you above your power. optimal, but this is one. It's actually okay to use debt to pay dividends if you're under that. Okay, yeah, right? then you so this, is, to this is why dividend analysis has to be tied to your capital structure analysis. So when you have an under-levered company that's using debt to pay dividends, yeah. you're okay with it. If they're reaching an optimal. If you, because you can argue that they're moving towards the optimal. If you have a correctly levered or an over-levered company that is using debt to pay dividends, you see that in that line item, net debt, mm -hmm. then you have a problem. Right? So that's combine the two analyses so that you know you can see what's happened in the dividend policy but tie it back to what you... So if you tell me your firm is under levered in the capital structure section, then you'll be okay. With it. Then you'll be okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. I get it first yeah. yeah. I have a, a question. My, my company for debt just uses a revolving credit facility, but they right. pay it back every single year and they take it out again on January first. Yeah. You have the interest expense. Yeah. I have the interest yeah. expense, and I included in my for everything. Mm -hmm. I read the notes they take out on January first. I included the the average is like forty million mm -hmm. as my debt. debt. Yeah even though they pay it back yeah. at the end of the year. But when I do the valuation... At the point, yeah, it's, it's fine. So to do a valuation, you do it at a point in time, right? Mm -hmm. At that point in time, there's nothing on their books. It'll still show up in your cost of capital. You give them the benefit of using debt in the cost of capital. When right. you subtract out the debt, you subtract out the actual debt outstanding, not the debt used for the cost of capital. Because right now, the revolving credit is off the books. You value the operating assets. You add the cash. There's no debt right now. So you don't have to subtract out the normalized debt at that stage in the process. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah. My question actually is similar to his. So my company does only operating leases and revolving debt, but they don't show the in any interest expense. They show it as... Operating as leases won't show up because yeah. they don't, it's not shown. If they're re revolving debt and no interest expense, they didn't use the revolving debt. Uh, but they just showed a charge in other income saying well, then if you can see what the charge is, you can back it out. But if you don't know what the interest expense yeah. is, act like they have no debt. Okay. Because that charge is a net of other things. Like they put a lot of things into other income. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. You can't separate yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what do you say about uh, beta for cash? Like you said, do not... Don't change. When you do cost of capital yeah. and you're, you're constructing the beta for your company, the bottom-up beta. Right. That bottom up beta should reflect just the operating businesses of the company. So let's say you have three operating businesses yeah. in cash. The beta you should be computing to go into cost of capital should be just the betas across the operating businesses. Okay, so don't add back the cash. Which will lower the beta. Don't lower the beta because you have cash. Because remember, the beta is a weighted average. Yeah. If you bring in cash as a business. Oh, cash as a business. Okay. Because, like, because that's a beta of zero, that'll lower the beta for the... I see, I see. So don't do that because then you're taking that putting into a cost of capital, which is going to be just for the operating assets. Hi. Hi. Uh, we're a leasing team. Yeah. Okay. We're using your optimal um, capital structure spreadsheet, and we both our companies don't have any debt, and we both got optimal debt a ratio of ninety percent, but our beta shot way up to around seven. Beta always should have. That's not the issue. I think it might be that the units are off. So when you get that higher debt ratio of companies in your debt, it's because somewhere along the way units got off. You're entering things in millions and you enter the number of shares in thousands. That's what I would check. Because what, that, what that'll do then is it'll inflate something or the other relative. So your EBITDA becomes huge relative to your market value. So that, that would be highly unusual to get a 90%. It's very unusual. You find it for a company that is very, it's a, it's a very old, mature company with huge cash flows. You might get 90%. But the very fact that your companies don't borrow money suggests that they're not. Yeah, they're, you know. um, my company is Lululemon. So it's only oh, definitely. Lululemon is li definitely not a 90% okay. company. So there's, there's something is off. Check your, op check your operating lease units. I mean, somewhere along the way, your units got off. Okay. Right? And if units get off, then basically the spreadsheet's numbers don't match up. Yeah, but the num each number might be right, mm -hmm. but the numbers across don't match up because some are in thousands, some are in millions. My suggestion is do everything in millions. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also for Section 7, yeah. um, moving to the optimal capital yeah. structure, um, in your Disney case, you regressed against macroeconomic variables. Mm -hmm. So for young companies... You, won't have, you don't run that regression. Just do it. Just do the bottom up, which you can still do. Okay. And do the intuitive, which you can still do. Okay. Um, so young company, that's a company that's... No, you don't have the history to run the regression. Okay. So you have to have at least 10 years or... 
at least 10 years or 20 quarters, something like that. Okay. You know. It's around 10 years. And also, um, Lululemon's 10K listed their competitors. Uh -huh. 